Hey, welcome back. This is a shop talk or shop update episode with a bunch of random clips that I didn't want to delete. And right now you see an example of where I had to adjust my workflow coming from my benchtop milling machine with a ton of quill travel and a lot of sea height above the table to the DACL FP1 mill with only 16 millimeters of quill and not enough height between the spindle and the table when using the fixture. So in this case I have to remove the table or the indexing head from the machine and bolt the fixture right against the apron of the machine. And this allows me to do the steep hole drilling operation on these PVC parts without trouble on this machine. It even allows me to drill with the C-axis power feed. I'm running, I think, 2000 RPM and 500 millimeters per minute feed, and I can drill 75 millimeters depth in one pass without chip breaking or anything. As you can see, loading the part into the fixture, using an end mill to spot face, and then power feeding the drill all the way to the center of the part without packing or or anything else. I have to say this the setup is extremely convenient and the copal clamp that's also held against the apron of the machine makes part changeover extremely convenient and fast. There are two more holes that are indexed off the 5mm hole that I just drilled and I use an index pin in the 5mm hole and there are stop pins in the fixture that create the angular indexing on the holes. So first one drilled and then I, I move the part over to the other position and drill the second hole. Machine moving on a shoestring budget. I'm moving the position of the Deckel S1 tool and cutter grinder once again and this machine is fairly heavy so it's, it's crowbar and hydraulic check work. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm screwing down a piece of wood to the floor to give me a hard point where the hydraulic jack can act against and then I'm just pushing the machine along using the jack. These are very inexpensive two-ton jacks and surprisingly they work in a horizontal position too, at least if the pump is on the underside. If I flip the jack 180 degrees over it doesn't work anymore. Surprise, surprise. And that's how I reoriented the tool and cutter grinder. This allows me to have full access to this side of the table, which is the important side and also still ugh, kind of stand in the front of it despite being very close to the wall. But uh, most of the time you're standing kind of on the, on the corner of the machine, you need to be able to get here and you need to be able to get here. And this is, as far as I can tell, a good compromise. 
I think it's the third or fourth time that I'm reorienting this machine and it's kind of getting old. Uh, it's an awful heavy machine and the floor in here is OSB, uh, chipboard, particle uh, oriented strand board is correct name. And so it's not fully supported and I cannot put this machine on wheels otherwise I'm, I'm very worried that I might crack through the OSB with, with, wheeled, with a wheeled base. But yeah, so the, the hydraulic jack is kind of useful if you have to push a heavy machine around and you have a wooden floor where you can screw into. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need some storage on the walls for the accessories of this machine. It's kind of a, it's kind of a mess currently, so uh, that's something to figure out. Also, no spiral hoses in the shop anymore for general use on the machines. Everything went to uh, flexible straight hoses. I'm building somewhat of a bottle car for my oxygen and propane gas bottle for the torch setup. And all the welding is already done and I'm here drilling and tapping the M6 threads for the casters. And on a drill press with a, a round column where the table can rotate around the column and with a table that can sp spin within itself. This is quite nice. You can clamp down the work once and access quite a few hole positions in, in the same setup. We will see in a second when I switch to the next hole that I'm just using the drill press like an inverted radial arm drill. Loosening both locks and then moving the table on two centers of rotation to get to the next position. With this workpiece, this is not 100% necessary. This is light enough to just reclamp it, to be honest, but uh, I think it's a neat way to, to utilize drill press. Uh, this gets interesting with larger work pieces. If, if you have somewhat of a casting setup and you need to align different positions and don't want to reclamp constantly, this works quite nicely. Aligning the center punch mark, drilling with a 5mm high-speed steel drill. When aligning, I'm just getting it close and then I look how the drill deflects and then I adjust the table or the workpiece accordingly until the drill hits the center point mark, the center punch mark straight on. Changing to a counter sink. And an M6 machine tap, power tapping. For simple work like this, I think that a drill press is good enough for tapping. You don't need something like a tapping arm. For a few holes, you don't need a tapping head. You just need a machine with a res reversible spindle direction. So, in many cases, you really, the, the tap arms, the, the, the parallelogram tapping arms look super neat and I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are very cool to work with, but especially with work that you can move around with your hands. I don't think that they are necessary. I'm working on some wood part. This is like 40 millimeter birch plywood, uh, laminated together from two sheets because I didn't have material the right thickness at hand. And I have to do two of them. Here's the second blank that I prepared. And it took me a little bit of time to get it centered on the on the rotary table because the center of rotation is five millimeter outside. So it just clamped the block on here and used dividers to draw the circle, then used a, a pointer in the spindle to center the part on the rotary table. I don't want to do that on the second one, so I'm going all woodworker here and I'm using some stop blocks. Uh, this is just a, a 
mediocre precision application. So using these two blocks as a stop will be sufficient. Also, I'm just using large cam twist clamps here to hold the, 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 the wood to the faceplate of the indexing head. Oh. Uh, this large high-speed steel cutter does a decent job of cutting the birch plywood. Okay. Let's get second wood. Now with the two stop blocks I just slide it in place. I have some hardwood cutoffs here. because the underside of the faceplate is a raw casting with some machined features and I don't want to clamp on the casting. So. Uh, these clamps are more than adequate for machining wood. <laughs> yeah, woodworkers, I know that routers exist. <laughs> I even own one. I own a woodworking router uh, that has chamfered a lot of aluminium. It also chamfered a lot of steel, but even did some wood in my shop. But mostly it's cutting <laughs> uh, things that are not wood. So here we go. Ah, I need to remove the stop block because it's crashing into the machine column. Okay, here we go. I'm taking about a five millimeter depth of cut per pass at a thousand RPM. Also the quill is extended a little bit, otherwise the clamp would crash into the underside of the C-axis, uh, Y-axis. Hold on, hold on with your comments. I know, wood chips can cause rust on blank steel and cast iron surfaces. That's why we clean the machines when we're done and we reapply machine oil to all the sliding surfaces and we use rust protective oils on all the non-sliding surfaces. It's the same case as if uh, on the right in the background you can see my 40 taper rack for, for the mill tooling. It's made of wood and I do not have rust problems because the, the wood is oiled. So there, the contact between the, the steel of the tool holder and the wood is on an oily surface. So I never have rust problems. It never had rust problems with tool storage on wood. So yes, it has to be addressed, but it's not a real issue. Okay, and that way we were able to cut uh, 40 millimeter thick material uh, with radius quite fast. And to be honest, doing this with a handheld router or with a circle jig on a router table and material that thick would require a fairly beefy handheld router or a router in general. And large routers scare the heck out of me. It goes around the gas bottle on this side to hold it in place. Just need to do a little bit of cutout so it fits between the two vertical posts here. Then it's going to be bolted in place. And here's the current status of the bottle cart. Plywood spaces that I made for the, for the O2 bottles are in place. And the bottle is ratchet strapped in place so it can't tip over. Currently I'm running my, my micro torch not of the big propane bottle. I'm running it from one of these small containers because I have an awful lot of these left and I just want to use them up before I break into the 
five kilogram propane bottle. And the funny thing is, usually you need way more oxygen than you need the actual fuel gas for things like brazing and heating for bending or screw removal. So the, the five kilo propane bottle is very much overkill. The casters I have chosen are very low profile, but make this thing movable enough and with the fairly wide footprint it's safe against tipping over. And if I have to move it somewhere else I'm putting the, the cap on the O2 bottle anyways. Uh, I need a spot to, to coil up the hose of the torch and I need some kind of storage for all the for all the torch accessories, the nozzles, the striker, things like that. And this combination with the large O2 bottle and the propane bottle now allows me to, to run a normal sized torch, like, like a fabricator would have, with a cutting torch that I never need, and larger brazing and heating nozzles. But for 99% of the work I do, the, the small Gregerson torch that I have here is more than suitable. And if you're very adventurous, you can put a, a regular sized cutting torch head onto it. But then you get into trouble with maximum flow of the hoses and the valves in here. But it's possible. Uh, I think Gregerson told me that you can run a cutting torch with this handpiece, but you're limited in the thickness of stock you can cut because you're limited in the flow of oxygen. It's that bad. But apart from that, um, so far I'm quite happy how it came out. It's very mobile for my shop. I can cart it over in the other side of the shop if I have to heat something on a machine or remove a stuck bolt or something like that. And well, it's mobile. And regular cart bottles that are uh, shaped like a like a, a hand truck, I don't like them very much. They look like they want to tip over constantly. And this feels a little bit safer. So I will post an upgrade once I added the, the, the hose coil and some storage for the accessories. At least one person asked what happened to the LIP 515 surface grinder, the French surface grinder that I used to have in the basement shop. And the, the, the short answer is it's sold. The long story that nobody wants to hear is it's sold to a friend and he picked it up today. So uh, got, it, got it with the lifting cart into his trailer and it's gone and he will hopefully put it to good use. Another work in progress in my shop is this thing. Uh, this looks like an awful lot of cables and it is. But that's just because we don't have wireless die grinders. Uh, this is my, this is the NSK Evolution die grinder with the power supply. And I, I'm playing around with some kind of a design to make it semi-mobile in the shop when I need to take it over to a surface grinder, for example, to deburr something in situation. Or when I have to take it over to a CNC and to the, do some deburring, or take it to a bench or in the office or whatever. And the original setup that, they, that these NSK power supplies come is of course, without the cardboard. Originally, it just looks like this and you have the two hand pieces just flopping around in the breeze. Yes, they have some kind of a holster here on the side where you can stick the dark grinder in, but not the belt grinder. So I figured I'm making a, uh, a kind of a carry case for the power supply that allows me to store 
the die grinder, I will come up with some kind of a captive holding system so it doesn't fall off. Maybe a 3D printed snap snap in thing with like like a, a, a spring clamp for uh, for conduit pipe. Very similar to that. It might be an idea. And it is also a spot for the NSK belt grinder. This is a super useful tool for very quickly deburring and super precise chamfering of straight workpiece edges. And with the slack belt side here, you can do excellent corner rounding and deburring. Uh, very nice, very nice tool. That said, it's a lot of cables and it's very ungainly. But with, with the carry handle here, I don't hate it. And I just rigged it up out of cardboard because I like to try things out before I build something. Otherwise you build it five times and you're still not happy. But this, well, it works. A, a little spot on the side to store some of the belts and some of the die grinder tooling will be nice. It will probably be a mixture out of plywood and 3D prints. Because that's very economical to make. Uh, the power supply has two threaded inserts on both sides so I can bolt the carry case to the side of the power supply and make it a, a monolithic structure. So that's at least the idea here. Not sure. Um, I will just give it a try for some time and then commit to some woodworking. Uh, maybe I will sneak into a laser cut and have the parts laser cut or I mill them on the CNC or I do it old school with a with the track saw. We will see. But um, I will I will I will probably do a a video on this topic and when I want to store it away or carry it somewhere else I can just put one loop in the cable, hang them over and same for the for the power cord, one or two loops in the cable goes over the top. Ready to go. Ready to <laughs> ready to do some EDC deburring. The parts for the low profile DTI holder are back from plasma nitriding. And usually when they come back, they look like this. They have they are grayish and have shadows all over them from the from, from the plasma process. This, this shadowy gray can get removed by using Scotch-Brite, Superfine Scotch-Brite, the gray stuff, uh, very quickly and very easily and, and you get back to your original surface finish very easily. And after plasma nitriding, these parts are extremely hard on the outside but still have their soft softish in a core but also this is a process that, process that doesn't uh, add a lot of distortion and warping to parts so all of these parts were machined to final dimension and partially also ground and it's still everything a very nice fit I think we can finally put it together after we cleaned up the parts with some Scotch-Brite. Oh, by the way, uh, Scotch-Brite creates a ton of abrasive dust, so be careful. Uh, that's not material, material that gets abraded from the part. That's the abrasive crumbling off the, the fabric. So keep that in mind. Uh, you need to clean parts that you Scotch-Brite Scotch afterwards. Uh, also, the material removal of Scotch Bright Superfine Gray is minimal, so I, I'm usually not worried hitting precision surfaces with this stuff. Usually, you, you die of old age before you alter any precision surfaces with it. Uh, that's very different to a Scotch Bright wheel on a bench grinder. Uh, that's very much capable of ruin, ruining precision surfaces and precision contours and parts extremely quickly so uh, be aware of that that's also the reason why I do not 
well, I have I have a scotch Bright wheel. I put it in the drill press if I need to, but that's not a standard tool for my shop. Yeah, that's the shank. This is also plasma nitride or plasma carbon nitride. Whatever the process is that the people that I use uh, do, they call it in the patented plasma treating and do not give out any further details. But it has worked very well for me and for the parts I use it for, so I'm not asking. <laughs> well, I asked, but they didn't tell me really. Which is fine in this case because I'm... Well, because it's fine. I think I'm going to leave this, the, the locking nut in the plasma nitride finish. I'm not going to bother with it. I kind of like it. It looks gives it a different look to the to the other parts. So let's put it together. Let's get rid of this piece of paper with all the grit on it. I also like to wipe down the table with some isopropyl alcohol after I'm done with the with scotch brighting just to try to contain some of the abrasive. So during the first fit up, I noticed that that the slider is tight in this very area here. Here and out here it's fine, but it's a little bit tight here and I think that it moved during milling, which is fine. It's really not a lot and I'm just using a mold stone here, 1000 grit mold stone, to remove a little bit of material from the sides of the slot to make it uh, conform to what I want. I put in a few more minutes of fitting and now it's an extremely nice sliding fit. Very tight but still free moving. Next is the screw that holds the slide to the body of the tool. Let's get screwed in completely tightened down and allows the slide to move around and we have a thread on the back side now with a tiny bit of molybdenum grease on the threads hello That's working. Uh, the eccentric shaft. I need to realign it, of course. But I will do that off camera. I showed it in the last video how it's done. Tiny dab of grease on these screws too. Just so if I take it apart in 10 years, I don't hate myself. Just like this. And the lock screw for the dial test indicator. Same here, tiny dab of molybdenum grease. And this is the lock. Now I need to dial test indicator. And here we go, indicator. And dovetail still fits. That's why I usually use for tools like this just the, the plasma treatment, not through hardening. Through hardening can sometimes mean that you have to machine or grind features after hardening, just because material moves around a lot more. Well, that said, if you use an air hardening steel like A2, you can get away with a lot without recutting in a hardened condition. So here we go. There were a lot of ideas in the in the video about adding a fine adjustment. Um, 
Well, if you build one, add a fine adjust. I was kind of lazy to design one in because it got everything got awfully small if I added a fine adjustment screw in here. But uh, give it a try. For me, this project is now uh, kind of done for now. But absolutely, feel free to, to modify to your needs. Uh, that's why I put out the plans, because I want to give you uh, a place to start if you want to build something similar. You don't necessarily have to follow instructions one by one. You can <laughs> uh, improve them. The first prototype, not a final product. Time will tell. Also, I need to cut down the, the well-down shank holder for the mill. Uh, all that's left is to be done. This needs to be cut down to about here. Redrilled and re-tapped for a lock screw. But for now, I can use it like that too. Here we go. Final prototype of the dial test indicator holder. You will see it for sure on in videos. Hey Stefan, your shop is all the time so cleaned up. Well, it's currently quite a mess. Uh, the CNC mill just has finished a big run of PVC parts, needs definitely some cleaning. Here are the parts. It's these uh, chemical fluid connectors out of PVC. Uh, some work holding for other projects. This is the Aerova vice. And over in the other room, well, there is more. In the mill, the deckle is set up for drilling a certain part. Uh, that's just packaging material. Another tray of parts. More boxes. More parts. More parts. And a lathe that's very much in need of cleaning. So that's, that's usually how my shop looks during the day when I'm working. Well, there's another big box. <laughs> um, that, that's how my shop looks during the day. Camera is constantly in the way. Uh, but I will clean up the shop till the end of the day and also package all these parts up for shipping. So, in the last video somebody mentioned in the comments that it would be interesting to see how many drills I grind over time with this machine. So, well, that's kind of a simple thing to solve. I got one of those uh, hand tickers, hand counters, and put it near the drill grinder. So, each time I'm grinding a drill, pink, add one to the count, and starting at 18th of November this year and this will tell me kind of over the time how much drills I grind until I get sick of this thing dangling off the handle here. Uh, this does of course not take into account the about 30 or 40 drills that I ground initially going through my drill indi index and also for the videos but I'm going to ignore those. Uh, these are Necessary regrinds now. Uh, just reground a 4.2 millimeter drill, which is tap drill for five for an M5 tap. Dust extraction seems to work fine. So far, I'm quite happy with it. And then, end of the day, one clean milling machine, one clean bench to the machine. Well. The drill grinder doesn't have a, a dedicated spot yet, so it sits back there. Uh, boxes are gone. Over here. Parts are gone. The lathe is clean. And the workbench is clean apart from the lined up work. So, uh, the floor is cleanish. 
vacuum cleaned usually and the mill is clean too. So that's my daily routine when I close the shop for the night. I have usually at least the machines cleanish and the floor definitely cleaned. If possible, I clean off as much bench space from unused tools and tooling as possible. And I try to have the surface plate clean. Same for the bench next to the CNC. Well, it's cabinet, but I use it as bench. Uh, I try to keep this one as, uh, as, as, as clean as possible so I can stage parts and assemble fixtures on here. Uh, these are some super glue Aerova fixtures. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for the support and I'll be back.